good soup. Game of Thrones Season 8, Episode 6, The Iron Throne. Had to throw in a little Davos there. The last time we're doing this. Our final Sunday, the final dun 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 dun. Bittersweet to the very end. Are you okay? You're trying to make me cry right now? I, I mean, you've been crying the whole time, man. Uh, dry, your, dry your ducks. It's sad, man. And I, I guess before we get started, I just want to thank everybody for uh, following us along this journey throughout the years. It's been a pleasure, I guess. So it's, it's been for, three years. Both we've been me doing and this. you, it's being, uh, being able to talk about Game of Thrones with such a passionate fan base. So it's, it's, it is it is bittersweet. It's uh, crazy, but we're here now, and we have to do our job. Let's talk about it. We have to review it, discuss it, theorize. Well, no more, actually. Yeah. <laughs> well, sequels, maybe, and prequels. No. Oh, no, we'll, we'll be back, but this is kind of like the end of the era. Oh, no, this is the end of the channel. <laughs> oh, yeah, it is? All right. Well, we don't decide that. Fate's been decided for us. Yeah, and I think to start with this episode, we have to start where the last episode ended, and it's the decision of Daenerys Targaryen to sack King's Landing in a way that it's never been sacked before with fire and blood. Well, uh, Tywin, Tywin sacked King's Landing. No, he, he sacked, tapped King's Landing. This was a fucking <laughs> punch to the fucking groin. He uh, gray wormed it. He gray oh, no, yeah, da yeah. Daenerys gray wormed it. Yes, she, yeah. she cut the pillar and the stones. Yes. Apparently he does have the pillar, though. He said in an interview. I did hear that. I yeah. think that's fan fiction. When uh, they said, hey, take the Unsullied, create your own house, he looked at him like Nick Young, all confused. <laughs> yeah. What? But the last episode, it was the destruction of King's Landing, the slaughter. We called her a, I called her a genocidal maniac. And it's funny, in episode four, I was like, if Cersei Lannister can't be beaten, you just got to burn it all down. <laughs> yeah. You got to burn the grass and grow new grass. And then she did that. And I was like, well, in your, in, your, in your defense, she was beaten. Exactly. I said if Cersei Lannister was beating her back against the wall, then you got to come out guns blazing. And it's the damage that he's surveying after what we witness. Now he's seeing the re the repercussions, the aftermath. And I think this was handled very well. He's slowly surveying this damage. You see people that are their skin is being peeled off. The the dead children lying on the floor. It's Tyrion, John, and Davos, and it's it's very disturbing from their perspective. And it's them seeing they put their faith in this woman, and she betrayed them. Yes, she betrayed them. She betrayed their trust. She she betrayed like what they believed in her. You hear Tyrion reflect on this, and we go and we see it throughout the episode. Is that not just Tyrion, but all these people like put their faith in her to be the rightful queen, to be just, to be good, and she disregarded all that in a single act. And it's horrifying seeing the aftermath. It's snowing ashes. Yeah. Right, and it's got a little um. World War Two yes. Hiroshima vibes too. Very, very much so. It's weird because, like, at times of war, when you defeat your enemies, it could be it could be viewed as an act of victory and her heroism. But when you're on the other side of that and you actually sit down and grasp what the actual repercussions of your actions were, it's horrifying. Yeah, and it's it's that real life tie-in. It's no secret that he's providing us commentary, George R. R. Martin, on wars, mm -hmm. on, on how history doesn't really account for the civilians, the small people that are being crushed by the wheel that Daenerys talked about. And it's a good point when you're seeing it from their perspective, especially with Daenerys, because we said it so many times last week, she had won. And a lot of times in history, and in this case in particular, there can be overkill. Just because you have that power, because you're sitting on top of a dragon, essentially a, a weapon of mass destruction, that if you're in that position and everything that has happened to you that all swells up, it can erupt into this. Look around you, friend. We won. I obey my queen's commands, not yours. And what are the queen's commands? Kill all who follow Cersei Lannister. These are free men. They chose to fight for her. Easy, man. Easy. Easy. This was a very tense scene. It was two characters that we know are good, kind of just split on their beliefs right now. And it was kind of weird to see Grey Worm in this position because we've seen his development throughout the years since Daenerys first met him, is that we kind of saw him have his own free will and 
breaking away from that mentality that he had as an Unsullied where they did everything their masters told them to. And here it's like the person you followed and who saved you committed this evil act and she wants you to continue following orders that are inherently evil and he's still doing it. I kind of wish we'd have seen a little bit more pushback from him, but it seems that he is fully on board with Daenerys, which I guess makes sense throughout the years. He's always followed her no matter what she wanted, but I guess when they kind of try to develop that they were kind of breaking away and that they were independent of thought that maybe there would have been a little hu- humanity in Grey Worm to be like, maybe John's right here. Yeah, and I think it, it works better for Grey Worm that you don't need that development because he is a soldier. This man has been bred to fight since he was a child. But John's a soldier too, and he can still find... He can John's, s- yeah, but John has had more examples of humanity in his life. John's only recently a soldier. Grey Worm's had nothing. Masande humanizes him by giving him a chance to be in a relationship, even though he can't, they can't have a traditional family, but she still accepts him for who he is. And then that was taken away from him, from him in such a brutal manner that he just reverts back to that, that instinct that was just bred into him since he was a boy of kill your enemies, kill the masters. That so I, it's sense, more, yeah. yeah, it's a, it's a bit more understandable for Grey Worm, but I would have liked that a bit more pushback, mm-hmm. see some of his morality. This was a tense scene because I wasn't sure what was going to happen if they were going to come to blows. We had said that on our preview video that we might see Grey Worm versus John, and they obviously have some tension mm-hmm. in this episode. Who are you taking though? If it w- if it were to pass, Grey Worm, you dude's a problem. So? Yeah, dude, that dude's a problem. I think we yeah. sleep on Grey Worm. Actually, I'll take John. <laughs> and one of my problems with this episode is that 15 minutes in is when we get to Daenerys's Hitler Youth speech. <laughs> <laughs> when she's riling up all of her uh, Dothraki. It's like Hawks. Yeah. From Star Wars. Yeah, a lot of this, like, I loved watching it play out in the beginning, but... We have an hour and 20 minutes left of Game of Thrones. Let's, exactly. Let's exactly. put the fast forward button on here, because Tyrion surveying the damage... I feel like these scenes were very useful, and the way they played out were very well done, but in the scope of we only have an hour 20 of this episode, then it kind of was like, I was like actually watching the my time. cable box. Yeah, me too. The time on my cable box saying like, oh, okay. What's, because 45 what, minutes in is when Daenerys dies. And like I there's thought, no Sansa yet. There's no yeah. Arya. Like, what are we doing here? Oh, there was Arya, but like I'm talking about in the sense of just the scope of the North, like coming down. Like I, I felt like we, we needed to get it going and it just wasn't getting going. And I guess that's just a problem with the season in general or well, the past two seasons was that it all felt very rushed. And well, I'll, we should do a drinking game. How many times we say that the yes. season feels rushed or that but it a lot should have of, been 10 episodes. And I think like a lot of the plot points, like if you view it from just the perspective of this is going to happen, it makes sense. And it's kind of poetic in a way. But when you, while you're watching it and just the scope of the season itself, it's like, it's very rushed and it could have been developed much better. But this is the problem that we always say that George is having. Yes. That we have, we theorize that he's just doesn't know how to end it. He doesn't know how to tie it up. Well, this is going to happen. This is going to happen in the books. A lot of it is going to happen in the books. So it's not a a lot of the main points here. It's not, it's, it's all a matter of. And that's why you almost have to give D and D some slack here because you're giving them the guidelines, but you're not telling them how to get there. You're giving them point A to point B, but you're not giving them the dash. They have to make it up in six months while George has been taking nine years. And we can, we've been saying it over and over again that it should have been more seasons, should have been more episodes, but there's two sides to this. Well, if you're going to say, and I'll talk about kind of the ending and then we'll kind of go back to what we were, what we were doing. But like, if you're going to say you don't like Bran being King, don't like Sansa being ruler of the North and John going back up North, that's a George problem, not a D and D problem. Like, cause they, they have the same ending, but I think if it was developed a little bit better and it, they took their time with it and played it out through I don't know, maybe 10 episode seasons for the last two, it would have felt more natural and believable. Right. And it's, I wonder how many people just have a problem where these characters end up, but that's almost, it's hard to get mad at them too, because they wouldn't know how they would feel about it if it was developed differently. Mm -hmm. We're just living in the timeline where it was rushed. So this is, maybe you have a different perspective on these personal endings for these characters if the route there was different, Mm -hmm. if, if it worked better for the people that don't like John being up north or Bran as king or Sansa as queen. Well, That's think, the thing. I don't have a problem with a lot of these endpoints. It's just it's just the road there. Well, I think a lot of people would have, like, even if you don't like Bran being king or John killing Daenerys or vice versa, no matter how it played out, people were going to not expect or not have the ending that they always predicted. Yes. But if it's developed well enough and you can kind of make sense of it, then it's not that shocking or jarring. 
But yeah, going back here to the episode, it's Tyrion finding Jamie and Cersei under all of the rubble. So all of those theories about them still being alive, they were not. They were clearly crushed <laughs> by a bunch of bricks. Yeah. Still hate it. It was an emotional scene, Tyrion crying over the bodies of Jamie and Cersei. And it was similar to Sam crying over his brother and some sympathy for his father, even though Tyrion hated Cersei. That's still family. That's the end of your family sitting right there in front of you, lying down right now right in front of you <laughs> well I like he saw he saw the gold hand and then he started yeah. taking away some of the bricks and it, and, it, and uh there was un- some hope in his mind maybe that it was just the hand by itself but the it hand maybe slipped off but it unveiled Cersei and Jamie. so yes. he was kind of crying over both of them yeah and obviously we saw last episode and what we've seen throughout the series is that he has a connection to Jamie, unlike he has with Cersei even when you go back to like season two three the conversations they have Tyrion still like she might not care for Tyrion the way that he does for her Tyrion still has that connection to her where he's always trying to mend those bridges. And I think at the end of the day, when you look at some of the season two scenes, he still thinks there's a relationship there. She does do things to break that trust, accusing him of killing Joffrey and all that. But even when we've seen it at the end of uh, season seven and in season eight, he still tries to reconcile that relationship. And that's just Tyrion's mindset. He's just a good guy who has the best view of people. And... Even yeah, in, I think it's circumstance that just kind of ruined their relationship. Yeah, and even in that moment, you can tell, like, there's a reason why they show both of the characters there with Tyrion crying over him. He's not just crying for Jamie there, he's crying for Cersei too. And then we get our first look at Arya, and it's everybody's watching for Daenerys Targaryen to come out, give her speech, and she flies in. But Arya is looking up at her. Jon is approaching as well. And it's the different perspectives where we have the Dothraki that are cheering her arrival, and Jon Snow is obviously still visibly <laughs> messed up <laughs> by what he's seen. And this arrival of Daenerys Targaryen, one of the best shots that we're ever going to see in the show, when she lands with Drogon, she walks out and the wings sprout from behind her. That's the Targaryen. That's the the last dragon. No, some of the shots of this episode were absolutely breathtaking. And that was one of them. There's a a scene, there's a shot later in the scene where he's off to the side and you have the dragon banner and her at the top of the stairs. It's just absolutely breathtaking. Yeah, the dragon banner, Drogon perched up there. Yeah. And the speech that she gives to the Dothraki, thanking them for staying by her side, referencing the speech that Drogo gave in season one mm-hmm. when Daenerys, when they attempt to poison Daenerys and he says that he's going to kill the men in their iron suits and rip down their houses stone by stone. So that was a nice callback. There were a couple of nice callbacks to the earlier seasons and earlier moments that foreshadowed where Daenerys' arc was going, which is still not character development. But she was great, and she's been great this entire season, Amelia Clark. This speech, like you said, it reminded me of Hux, just a dictator riling up his troops, feeding them what they want to hear, convincing people that she is still a liberator. She's trying to paint this as, we liberated the city of King's Landing from a tyrant. Let's go liberate the entire world. <laughs> she, uh... She went full Alexander the Great here. Let's take it all over. Dorn and Winterfell, John's like, wait a minute. I live in Winterfell. Oh, I that, used that, to that, live that, in Winterfell. That's my home. <laughs> yeah. That's where my sisters live. Said fucking Castle Rock to Quarth. Yeah. That's like, deep. Wait, that's Qu- not Do you remember how far Quarth was? Like, Quarth is in the middle of the fucking desert. Well, she remembered what, how they, they did her dirty. Yeah. She's like, yeah, I gotta go she back. She's coming back for them. But it's just... And, it, and two, like... The comparisons you made were just, but like her, her mannerisms and her character was still very Daenerys. Yeah, it's a speech that you would expect Daenerys to give before arriving but, in. King's but it's Lightning like Daenerys giving troops. giving that speech. Let's kill, like let's go after Marine. Let's get the sla- the slave cities. But now like, we it, know what she really means when she was yeah, giving all of those I know, speeches. I know. But if you put that in perspective, like let's liberate the slave cities. Let's liberate, yeah. like back in season four or five, you'd have been like, yes, Queen, liberate those cities. But now, like, after you see the destruction she caused and what she's talking about now, it's not liberate, it's burn them, I guess. Because yes. after what we just saw. I mean, she's very, like, even keel about it. Yeah. It's not like, she's not angry. Like, I guess the speech is inspiring a lot of, like, emotion, but she's not, she's not unhinged. No. She's, she's not, not like what yeah. you would, uh, would, like, think, like, Eris was. That's the Mad King. Like, absolutely insane. She's not that in this moment. Yeah, she's a calculating villain, mm-hmm. and we've seen this before in the show. Characters like uh, Roose Bolton. You wouldn't see Roose Bolton absolutely going mad mm-hmm. when he's trying to rile up his, his troops, but he's still a very evil man. So we see that all the time. There's two types of villain. There's a Joffrey, and then there's what we have here with Daenerys. And Tyrion approaches her in this scene, and she looks at him and says, you committed treason, you freed your brother. He goes, yeah, I freed my brother. You slaughtered a city. Yes. <laughs> so... Not really, we're not really even here. 
the way that he threw uh took off the hand of the kingpin and threw it to the ground i love that and they stopped stomping the uh yeah. spears they knew right away i love that from Tyrion. and it's kind of nice job promotion gray worm i name you master of war so, wow thank uh, you th- yeah. <laughs> thank you <laughs> Um, but I love that moment from Tyrion. That's all you needed. Tyrion was for really- their last conversation. That's all you needed. You freed your brother. You committed treason. I freed my brother, and you slaughtered a city. The scene and the couple, the scene with John, I thought Tyrion was very strong this episode. Yes. Yeah, I love how he's, you know, just kill me now. If this is the way you want to rule, this is the way you want to go about your business. I don't want to be a part of it. Right. It's the first time that somebody pushed back too. Even mm-hmm. after she gives that speech where she's trying to justify it or paint it as something else as liberation, Tyrion reminds her what she actually did. She, in that moment, she realizes that obviously not everybody is going to see this the way that she did. And when you're somebody who's so committed to your ideals and to the new world that you want to create, that's just an enemy. It's not Tyrion Lannister, who was my friend for years, who helped me get into this position of power, who's always been loyal to me. It's just an enemy. It's just another person in the way. It's a well, threat. Well, we've seen that relationship kind of stumble. Yes. Over the uh, past few episodes where he has made mistakes. But we have Jorah saying, telling her in... Um, I almost wish Jorah didn't die in the long night. I know, but we had Jorah... That made a great scene. We had Jorah telling her before he died, like... You know, trust this man, like his mind, the mind behind that mouth is brilliant and all this. And it kind of reassures Daenerys, but th- it was set up for her, for them to not see eye to eye on this, to say the least. Yeah, she, uh, she has him put in change and they take him away and... Yeah, she departs as well to go and, I guess, you know, do king stuff, queen stuff, do some paperwork, get some contractors here, rebuild the city. And as she's walking away, Arya sneaks up on John again. He's like, whoa, what the fuck? Where did you come from? Where did she just came and he turned around and grabbed her by the throat and she had to do the drop move again? <laughs> she did the, just stabs him in the gut. So, oh, sorry, it's instinct. <laughs> and she tries to warn him that not only is Tyrion a threat to Daenerys, you're the biggest threat because yeah. she knows who you are, that you are Aegon Targaryen. Good point by Arya, although yeah. we see in a later scene that Daenerys was still trying to get him on her side because she still loves him, very much so. But a nice moment between Ari and John here, just to, to see his sister, to see that sh- what she went through. Maybe that's in his mind when he does make the decision to kill her. That not only did you just put innocent people's lives in danger, but my favorite sister, one of my best friends from childhood. Well, Tyrion reiterates that point later in their scene, but yeah. here it's with John. It's he's refusing to believe it. Oh he's, yeah, he's in yeah. denial, and I felt like he this, just doesn't want to do this anymore. This scene and the Tyrion scene. And even part of the Daenerys scene, it's like, I was watching, like, all right, come on, John, You can't be that fucking stupid. And then we ultimately see what he does, and you're like, okay. It's denial, yeah. Yeah. But right here, he's in full denial, and he's kind of trying to rationalize it. And you can see Arya, and even Tyrion in that scene, are making points that hit home with him, but he's still trying to wrap his head around it. Yeah, and in the scene with Tyrion, where he goes to visit him in the cell, they have that conversation about what Daenerys just did, and John is very much... Like you said, he is in denial because this is a woman that he still loves. He might not love her as a lover anymore, but he's also just, he's tired of fighting. Mm -hmm. He says to Tyrion, the war is finally over. Now we can rest. Maybe she did go a little bit too far, but, and Tyrion says to him, do you think that the war is really over? I know you couldn't hear, understand the speech, but the Dothraki were cheering it, okay? That wasn't necessarily, hey... The war's over. Everybody take your uh, summer vacations. Yeah, you collect your 401k. <laughs> this was a great scene between John and Tyrion. And it's Tyrion trying to hatch the plan of John betraying Daenerys, that he is the one that could end this tyrant's very short reign. Well, while I was watching this, I'm like, he's not Ned Stark's son, but who is he most like? Yeah, he's just Ned Stark. What, did, what would Ned Stark do? And we've seen Rob Baratheon, even though he didn't directly kill the Targaryen children, it was Tywin and the Mountain, he kind of just, they put the bodies in front of the throne, and he's like, okay, that needed to be done. And Ned was sick to his stomach. Wouldn't talk to Robert for a while. That kind of ruined their relationship for a bit. And Daenerys did this times a million while I was, like, watching this, like, Jon's just still trying to rationalize it. I'm like, that's kind of out of character, but Ned didn't... He loved Robert as a friend, but he wasn't... Robert also didn't have a dragon. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, he sure. also wasn't the most powerful person probably the show has so ever like seen. Ned, Ned would have never stood for that. No. He no, would have never even have tried to rationalize yes. in head. But that's the difference between Ned and John. Like, John was actually in love with Daenerys, and they had that moment, like, that intimate relationship together. So he's still trying to, in his mind, he's not able to rationalize that someone he loved was capable of doing that feat. And Yeah, and Tyrion remarks that love is, love clouds reason. And then John brings back the Maester Aemon line that love is the death of duty. And I thought he was going to take credit for that line. When Tyrion's like, did you just come up with that? John was, yeah, I did. They just come to me in my head, spontaneous. And Tyrion flips it on him and says, duty is the death of love. He's like, wow, you said what I said, but backwards. <laughs> <laughs> to John, he's like, you convinced me. Was, was this scene a little meta for you? Oh, wh- well, yes, because it's Jon Snow once again trying to rationalize Daenerys' decision, saying that Cersei gave her no choice, that she had to take the city this way. And then Tyrion starts to call back to all the moments of Daenerys Targaryen through the years of burning Astapor, burning the Masters of Marine, crucifying the Masters of Marine, burning the cows alive. That It's so funny because Marissa, if you guys listen to our spoiler discussions, she almost made this exact point word for word. No, she made the exact point word for word. Yeah, it was crazy that we've always treated these as victories, that we cheer for Daenerys when these things happen. And I actually, for a moment here, they were starting to convince me that the Mad Queen turn works in this season because Mm -hmm. maybe it was just something brewing underneath that even Tyrion couldn't see that we were all blinded to it because we were treating them as victories that it made her feel more just and more powerful we get that in the next scene too her idea of good versus evil I know what's good for everybody I am morally right my my word is morality the weird part was while I was watching this because the mad queen turn for Daenerys that plot point was very divisive amongst fans. And um, some people were saying, look at these reasons for why she did it. And the others were like, those reasons don't justify why she became mad. And I don't know what point Tyrion was trying to make. Because he was kind of making both points. Like, he did all these things. She did all these things. And it's kind of like, those were the points that people were making to justify it. But you can use those same points to say, no, that doesn't equal her burning an entire city down. It was kind of amazing because it's almost like the writers knew what the response was going to be. Yes, yes. That people are going to be frustrated by maybe this being such a dramatic turn for the character. But still, it just wasn't, there wasn't enough in her character. There weren't these moments of, they kept telling us that she was impulsive. We didn't really see it in her personality. It's, she was just strong-willed <laughs> and then they turned her into a mad woman for a moment but then even after the fact she's more thanos where she is very calm and collected and she's able to rationalize and give us her philosophies on good and bad and morality and war in a way that almost convinces you that she's trying to manipulate you rather than make you subject to her will and then if you say no she'll burn you alive well, watching this, I already had it, like, I wasn't really thinking about last episode anymore. I wasn't thinking, like, oh, she, it wasn't developed properly for her to be Mad Queen. I kind of just, like, oh, she's Mad Queen now. Let's see how this plays out. Yeah. And from that standpoint, I think it kind of, I liked her in this episode. You know what this reminded me, too? It was reverse because Tyrion was the one locked up. But it reminded me of Ned and Varys. When Varys is trying to convince Ned to take the black, proclaim Joffrey the true heir to the Iron Throne, do it for your daughters. And that's the last thing that Tyrion says to John before John leaves, saying, do you think that your sisters are going to bend the knee to Daenerys? And it's what makes John. that's almost the final straw where he realizes what Daenerys might do to the people that he considers family, that are his family. So it reminded me of that. And then it switches to the next scene where John is going to visit Daenerys in the Red Keep. This, was, this scared the shit out of me when Drogon was napping mm. in the snow. <laughs> Ash. Uh, Snow or Ash, right, Ash, yeah. And I thought, you know, is he going to attack him? Is he going to scream at him? Imagine John screamed at Drogon like he did to Viserion. <laughs> it's like, this worked last time, right? <laughs> ah! Great shot. You just like, see uh, how big Drogon is compared to these little tiny... He's like, humans. oh, shit, John, what's up, man? You're a Targaryen. I know, <laughs> I know. Come in, man. I can sniff you. <laughs> this scene was... It was a lot. It's a lot to dissect. I mean, her going up... And we saw from the uh, vision she had in season two that she reaches for the throne. She never actually touches it and the snow falling down. And here she actually does grab it, but it's not snow, it's ash. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of people made comparisons to back then and everyone's like, oh, the showrunners didn't say, they said it was snow. People were complaining about that. Like, oh, what are they going to fucking give away that it's ash? Like, I think it's it's clever. At at the point, it's the vision. So in the vision, it was snow. 
but visions don't always come 100% into fruition. Having a BH makes complete sense. Whatever and, happened to Azura High? Uh, <laughs> that was back then. But I'm just saying, like, that was a complaint I saw. It's like, oh, they said it was snow, yeah, well, but that's it's a ash. ridiculous complaint. And it's like... This was brilliant because yeah, they... Yeah, it was still amazing. Like It, it was it, almost shot for shot, her work walking up to the throne yes. from season two in the House of the Undying. And I said when I was watching it that she's not going to touch the throne, that John's going to come in and stop her from ever touching it. But she does. I thought the same thing, too. And I like how she touched it, but she never sat it. I'm queen. I got it. <laughs> no, she didn't. Yeah. She hit base. She did hit base. You can't get me now. It's John uh, John Wick at the Continental. Can't kill me. Yeah. But John, yeah, he comes in and she never sits on the throne, which is going to be frustrating for some people. But somebody made a point on Twitter. This is not my point, And uh, I forget who it is, but it was a great point that George R. R. Martin tricked us into rooting for Daenerys to capture this throne that's made of swords and it's it's ugly and it's it's covered in blood. It cuts you when you try and sit on it. And it's the symbol of absolute power. Why were we rooting for her to, <laughs> to get this? It's when you realize it, and I think Drogon realized it in the end when he destroys the throne. It's It's the genius of his writing that he took somebody and he corrupted them and we were rooting for this, but we didn't know that inadvertently we were rooting for the destruction of a beloved character. And it's pretty genius. I just wish it was developed more in the show. But, yeah, she never sits on the throne. John comes in, and she goes right into telling a childhood story like nothing happened. Quick going back to the throne. I think I said this uh, in one of our videos last week that the, vi- the victory, that's something we always wanted to see, Daenerys getting the Iron Throne. And we always thought this would be a victory and a moment of triumph. It's not that anymore. No. It's like, because you know what she did. So I thought that was genius too, just taking that away from us. Like, we finally see that moment, but it's not what we ever thought it would be. We both said that no one would ever sit the Iron Throne at the end, right? Yes. It happened. A little, it didn't happen the way I thought it would. I thought they would just break the wheel in a different way, but we actually seen, no, the Iron Throne doesn't even exist anymore. Um, it was a nice meta moment too when she talks about how she envisioned the throne as a child. That's how the throne actually looks in the books. Well, this is the first time she finally sees it. I'm wondering yeah. too when when she was walking up. I'm like, she a probably thousand blades. She probably thought things. it was a throne that we've seen from the uh, artwork. Yeah, which would have been cool. But I love the Iron Throne in the show. And she starts giving this story, and John's like, "They were boys down there." Rob was so proud of him. That was his "They were boys" moment. No, <laughs> it was better. No, it wasn't. <laughs> Rob's "They were boys" will will go down as the greatest line ever spoken in this. TV show. That is a ridiculous statement. They were his kids. They were boys! Like I said, it, it reminded me of almost um, Thanos and Gamora when they're in his throne room, mm-hmm. where he's trying to tell a story about he, how she was such a fierce fighter when they were younger, and she's like, you know, you want to kill half the population. It's the same thing with Jon Snow. It's you just killed half the population of King's Landing. We can't be having this sentimental trip down memory lane. Well, how old was she when she couldn't count to 20? I hope she was like three or four. It's like <laughs> I was when I was say, 11 like... years old and I couldn't count to 20. <laughs> 21. <laughs> She's that kid. Um, yeah, another great shot. Their last embrace. Oh well, once goodness. again, John is almost trying to see, is there any hope for this woman? Yes. Is well, there one last hope? And this conversation, this back and forth that they have about deciding what is good and the idea of we must build a society built on mercy. And the Daenerys says, yeah, that, that's, that's all fine, but once I build this new world that you can't envision yet, because it's hard to envision something that you've never seen, John is saying, I kind of just saw it last night. <laughs> I saw what you did to King's Landing. I know what you want to do to build this type of world. I don't know if that's worth it. But this philosophical back and forth, uh, similar to Littlefinger and Varys, yeah. it was almost like a recreation of one of those scenes. What do we have left once we abandon the lie? Chaos. A gaping pit waiting to swallow us all. Chaos isn't a pit. Chaos is a ladder. What is good and bad, and what are the necessary steps to take to build a world that you perceive as good? And when John makes the point of, you know, not everybody is going to agree with your point of good, Daenerys is like, fuck them. <laughs> you see what I just said? Yeah, they don't matter. They don't get to choose. They She's don't not- get to choose. I think that was the moment where John was like, it's hard to say like w- when he decided he was going to do what he did, but that was like for the audience and my perspective. But when she said that, and I'm like, all right, that's when John had to do that. 
Right. And it's it's once again, it's Daenerys not outwardly saying I'm a tyrant, I have full control. It's that's why I thought the scene was very well written. But yeah, their their final embrace of John once again saying the line, You're my queen which made me laugh. Once he said that, I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you dumb? But when, obviously, in retrospect, you're like, okay. Pulled the old Ramsey Bolton on her. That, I, I thought the same exact thing. When <laughs> Ramsey first stabbed Ruse, I'm like, who stabbed who? Yeah. Here, I'm like, who, 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 uh? I heard it. I'm like, I don't see it. What's going on here? It was a very elegant sound. Of It was very swift. It was, which. Um, I knew it was coming because somebody fucking spoiled it in the comments. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Well, someone commented that Braun killed her, so <laughs> that didn't happen. But even when I read that, I'm like... Yeah, he has no choice. He has to kill her. It was very... You ever see the fan art of... Uh, when he kills her with the sword? And it's flaming? Yeah. It looked very eerily similar to that. It wasn't right. uh, Longclaw, but... In, in, in this shot, but in the fan art, it was. Well, I guess it's an Azora High moment that he kills the woman that he loved to bring light to the world. Lightbringer? Right? No, not really. We theorized for a long time, many fans have, that John would end up having to kill Daenerys, whether it would be to defeat the White Walkers or for this. Nobody, bring peace yeah, to the bring, realm. Yeah, bring peace to the realm. And that's kind of what this was. It's it's interesting, though, because even though she did go crazy, she almost, in a way, she paved the way for them to try and build a new world. She just couldn't be around for it anymore. <laughs> yeah. I think my... I like it, but my main problem with that is that my, my complaint that isn't, isn't that it happens so suddenly because we've seen deaths happen that were deserved and they were developed. Like Rob, when he died, like it happened. It just happened, right? Like the Red Wedding started and you're like, oh my God, what's going on? And you kind of look back and you realize like all that led up to it and it made sense. And you look back on this and you're like, all right, it makes sense because of what she did, but it wasn't as, and that's, this is a problem for the whole season is properly developed where it just happened and there was still 40 minutes left in the episode, and it felt like a very finite thing to happen. It kind of just went on from that. It was very, very abrupt from that into the next scene and from the rest that played out because the ending I don't hate, but the in-between between this moment and the last couple of shots was very... I don't even know the word. It was kind of a mess. Yes. It was a bit jumbled up. It's like this, ha- like this happened, and it made sense, and it was beautiful, poetic, whatever word you want to use, but... But I watched Daenerys Targaryen die, and I didn't really feel bad for her. I was more emotional when... When Lady died? No, when Brienne was writing a fucking book than <laughs> Daenerys Targaryen dying. I, mean, I know. Think about that, though. Like, that's... But it's, not, it's, once again, it's not a problem of this episode, but in a way it is. It's just the problem of the last couple of seasons. I couldn't... This f- moment of Jon killing Daenerys Targaryen, yes. arguably the main character of the show, feels weightless. It didn't shock me, obviously, it, it, because it was spoiled for it me. Sh- it shocked It shocked you. me. But I, we I all knew that she was going to die. Mm-hmm. Once again, it's that inevitable conclusion. You should just be rooting for it not to happen. Yes. And in this moment, it just didn't hit me the way that it should have. No, it didn't. It and didn't hit me like it hit Drogon. Like I said, Brianna writing in a book. That got me. That got me bad. But this is the ultimate... Cl- like, this is the moment. This, this is, is basically the true end. Everything else is an epilogue. Yes. This is the moment of the, 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 the Song of Ice and Fire. This is the ending. It's John and Daenerys coming together. And Drogon knew right away. That was scary. I didn't. Uh, I didn't well, at first, I felt do. bad for Drogon because he was crying over yeah. her body and he's trying to push her. Somebody said that he looked like Simba trying to wake up his dad in The Lion King. And it was similar to that. You hear him cry and he's wondering if Daenerys. You know, is, she, is she dead? It's an emotional moment between them because Drogon is the dragon. He's the face of the dragons. He's the biggest one. He's. Daenerys' favorite. He's been Daenerys' favorite for all these years. And he makes the decision. That's what you talk about, dragon intelligence. Well, first, he doesn't kill Jon. And I thought Jon might have been in trouble. Yes, me too, me too. You think he was going to try and burn him? At first, I kind of wish he did. After seeing, like... Me too. Yeah, after the In the aftermath, that Jon went out like that. But that last scene was kind of... It made sense. But when they first said that Jon was going to the Night's Watch, I was like, he should have died from Drogon. That would have that would have actually made me feel better. Well, Drogon 
it's amazing that he knew that Daenerys' death became inevitable that because she became corrupted by the Iron Throne. So I'm not going to kill Jon. I'm not blaming Jon Snow for this. He was put in, in an impossible situation. I'm going to destroy the Red Keep and then destroy the Iron Throne because this is the symbol of power that destroyed my mother. And to me, that's I think it's got it's got to be a George thing. We've said for years that the Iron Throne was going to be destroyed. Nobody would sit on it, although there is technically a ruler. Not technically, there is a ruler now. And he destroys this symbol of power once and once and for all. Something that his, I guess in a way, his ancestor, Balerion the Black Dread, created, he destroys. So it's come full circle for House Targaryen. Mm-hmm. To me, that was beautiful. No, that was a great scene. It was. And it speaks to their intelligence. And he grabs her, flies her off to presumably uh, old Valyria. That was awesome, too, when he grabs yeah. her by the foot. Probably old Valyria. You would think that's the place where they would both go to rest. He mm-hmm. would live out the rest of his days. I mean, what is he going to do? for the rest of his life. Take back what's his with fire and blood. <laughs> oh, Valyria. <laughs> right, and it's the end for <laughs> Daenerys Targaryen. Amelia Clark gave a performance of a lifetime. She wrote that farewell on Instagram that this is the role that shaped her adult life as an actor. Well, and she's progressed. Tremendously. That, yeah, throughout the seasons. Well, it's, it's interesting because it's the character and the actor mm-hmm. because she starts off as very naive and very innocent and she's lost in the world. And you can almost see that in her as a, her, her abilities as an actor, but she's really grown with the character. I never thought she was bad. A lot of people think she was bad in the earlier seasons. I never thought she was awful. She was good, but she progressed tremendously. And she's always had the moments. Like when she needed to bring it, I look back to the scenes where... She freed the Unsullied and took down the Masters of Asipur. That was one of my favorite scenes in the entire show. A dragon and, is not a slave. Yes, and the command she has over that scene is brilliant. The way she's progressed as an act- actor and the character as a whole has been wonderful to see. And Season eight's her season. She I, gave the best performance out her, of any of them. It's her standout season, and it makes sense, it, that being the end of her character. Such a... Uh, man, it's still like hard to wrap my head around the way that we saw her in a pilot into this moment just how it happened and all the trials and tribulations she had to go through to get to this moment and for it to end like that is bittersweet like george always said could have been developed a little bit better but daenerys targaryen dead yeah pour one out for the mother of dragons and we'll see what how her arc ends in the book but in the show farewell farewell daenerys <laughs> yes Amelia clark come on the pod yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and this is really where the epilogue begins. Yes. And it's um. That's what felt weird to me because the end, episode ended after forty minutes. Right. Yeah. And then you have another forty minutes of this. Yes. Where it begins with the Knights of the Round Table. Tyrion is taken out by the Unsullied, and this was shocking to me. Just seeing Sansa and Arya and Bran, Edmure, Robin Aaron, Robin Aaron. Somebody on Twitter said nobody's talking about his glow up. He did look very different. Unnamed Prince of Dorn. Unnamed Prince of Dorn, sitting with his like th- Dornish swagger. The three northern men that were there. Like I don't know who these people were, but they all look like northern men. Like any anybody you can't place. You had the Dorn Dornish man with his drip. Always looking fucking fresh. And the rest were just like Howlin' Reed. Generic <laughs> Northerners it seemed like, but yeah, it was kind of Yara. Yeah, I was trying to figure out what's going on. You had uh, Jan Royce, you had fucking Edmure Tully. How much time has passed? I thought for a second we were going to see like eight, one year later or something like that, but it just kind of happened, and this was a very awkward scene. Very awkward. It was very awkward because they injected comedy with the Edmure Tully, well, because Tyrion says that we should just pick a, a, a new king. Yes. That we have the most powerful people in Westeros here. Let's just pick a new ruler right here and now. And when Edmure Tully stands up and he tries to make his case, didn't need that. Sansa tells him to sit down. We haven't seen this guy since season six. Yeah. And he never really had that big of a role. The dialogue in this scene, the back and forth between all the characters, just didn't feel very natural. This should have been more powerful than it was. Um, It felt very small. And even Sam, like, saying, oh, you know, he was like, he's nervous, Sam. Like, uh, you know, uh, maybe he was like, oh, maybe we should do like democracy. Right. And it's very, very on the nose because we always said that it might end with a democratic system being in place. It was hilarious to me that they all started laughing. When I, he says everybody should get a vote. It was so on the fucking nose that. Yeah, but democracy is a joke. So that was funny. Everybody should get a vote. I know. They're but, all like, why, though? But the way he was like, he was so timid in what he was saying. And it's like something we always thought was going to happen. And their reaction was just like, all right, we get it. We know what you're trying to go for and it could have just been done so much better to drive home this point we want to break the wheel and instill a 
new way of leadership in Westeros where Bran can't have children and that's okay. We'll just elect another. The leaders of Westeros will come together and elect another leader. And just the way everything played out in the scene, it should have been more. It should have been almost as big as the previous scene. It's you're, in, you're electing a new king. We're finally getting the leader of Westeros after all this struggle and all this back and forth and these battles and deaths. And it was just, oh, Bran is the memory. Bran is the smartest person. He knows the past and he doesn't want the throne. Maybe that's... Maybe that's why he's best suited for it, and it kind of just happened. Yeah. Where he, he he just suggests it, and everyone's like, "Oh yeah, okay, Bran." When Sans is right there too, like there was no no back and forth. And obviously, Sans suggests that the North will be their own kingdom, and Bran accepts. And I like the aftermath of it. That that makes sense. But the way it was all figured out, it was rushed and unnatural. And it is a George thing. Brand sitting on the Iron Throne. It's a very logical choice. The guy is all knowing, all well, seeing. Vegas, man, they never lose. He no, was the favorite don't. before the season. I'm like, what? What are they? What are they? What do they know? Leaks, maybe. <laughs> I guess Vegas read the leaks. So you don't really need a judicial system because Brand Stark can just see if you've committed the crime or not. Mm-hmm. He's basically Skynet surveying everything. It's 1984 medieval version in Westeros. Brand being on the Iron Throne is something that I never predicted. I don't know how I feel about it. I guess it's it's fine. Because it makes sense that they're going for, it is kind of more of a constitutional monarchy rather than a straight up feudalistic society where you're passing down the throne to your children. Like we know that Bran cannot have children. That was always stress with Daenerys' character. By the way, what happened to all that foreshadowing for Daenerys and Jon's kid? They always said, she couldn't have children. Can't have children. Should have been listening. She, yeah. But I I don't mind Bran sitting on his, don't need the Iron Throne if you've got your own chair. (laughs) Um... No, but it was it's, it's a scene that should have been more epic. It should have been King Arthur, a giant fucking table, some nice music, a new theme maybe for Bran, Bran the Broken theme. And the idea that Bran, I, I love that idea of what's the best story because stories cannot be destroyed. You can't fight against memory. That if, some, if, if people can remember this, if people can pass this down from generation to generation, it would never be lost. And that goes to the idea that we had about Rhaegar's Song of Ice and Fire. That's the best place to hide information to make sure that it's safe. So I like that idea. I, I hate the well, King we, of the Six Kingdoms. Just doesn't roll doesn't off the ring, tongue. Doesn't <laughs> ring. Doesn't uh, ring. I mean, we said like our prediction was John was going to win and give Sansa his, uh, the Northern Kingdom. This was obviously... Yes. The, uh, I love Sansa, Same, same principle, North. different twist, but it's like... But at the same time, it's like, if this was Bran that I loved in seasons one, two, three, and four, I would have been okay with it. But this new Bran we got, if he identified more of that character that we got to know in the earlier seasons and still had that Bran Stark in him, I would have been more on board than just this Dr. Manhattan Bran that we have now. It's Actually, not It's not the Bran that I, I loved. Uh, Bran was one of my favorite characters for the first four seasons and one of my favorite characters still in the books. And this is not Bran. Right, and I like that because he- George is basically telling us this is what a ruler should be. He should be completely impartial. He should have no bias. He should only adhere to one thing, the truth, which is completely ridiculous. Yeah. You're never going to get that in a ruler, but that's the near-perfect ruler. You're just, you just want Bran more of his personality. And, also- and he had a little bit of... He had more personality in this season. He had not enough. a very dry, very, barren, Sahara very Desert sense of humor. <laughs> the fucking Dothraki Sea. <laughs> he would not hit at the nightclubs in New York City. No. Um, That's an intellectual humor. <laughs> and two, we see the um, the way Grey Worm and the Unsullied reacted to what happened. I love that when Davos is like, take the reach, start your own house. Grey Worm's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> What? That was stupid. Um, <laughs> that was a stupid suggestion. Maybe you shouldn't have a say. Yeah. Um, but moron. Like how they took John. They they put him. Like, do you think John like? So admitted, Tyrion, yeah, Tyrion and John. Well, no. Do you think John like admitted to it after? Oh, hundred percent. Drogon or, literally cleaned out all the evidence. Yeah, he ratted scene. on himself. It's like, yo, you wouldn't believe what happened. She just hopped on Drogon and dipped. Yo, she just she She's was like, like, like yo, I can't do this. John, anymore. John, you, you you got the king. You're king. Yeah. But I'm taking the throne. No, I'm gonna so, melt it down. But they imprisoned him, and they were just trying to figure out what to do with these Tyrion and Jon. And next we see Jon is with Tyrion. Yeah, and Tyrion is named Hand of the King. I did love that when Grey Worm says that Tyrion deserves justice. And Bran says, yeah, I just gave it to him. He's going to be a public figure for the rest of his life. <laughs> He's going to have to help me rebuild this mess. The scene between Tyrion and Jon, it's presumably the final scene, even though at the end Tyrion says, ask me in ten years if you think you made the right decision about killing Daenerys. And that's their final conversation here. 
John learns that he has to go back to the Night's Watch, and he has a question that I think all of the audience asked. Is the Night's Watch still around? What What do you say that we do with the Night's Watch now? When I watched the last scene, I'm like, if there's a White Walker, I will fucking lose it. In a good way? No. In a bad way. Yes. That would have been... Cause that's what I thought. And, I um, thought we were going to hear the White Walker theme. I would have been very upset. When it, when he first said that, I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> I'm, no, I'm like, are you fucking dead ass? Aegon Targaryen. Like, why is he Aegon Targaryen? Why does that matter? Why? Why? So Bran's king and Jon's going back to the Night's Watch, but... But they kept always talking about this conflict between Jon and Daenerys because of him being Aegon. And Ari even says she's but going they to see you as that, a threat. They would but have had that conflict with that, regardless of that. I know. That's what I'm saying. But she didn't even see him as a threat in that final scene when yeah. he's in the throne room. She's just talking to him like he's an old buddy. I guess with the Drogon We never thing. see any of this play out. It's a, it, People just keep talking about mm. things that could happen, but they never actually do happen. Yeah. And even Bran. Bran becoming the quintessential perfect king. The lore of him being a warg, of him being able to see through time, that's what it's for, so that he can be just a really, really good politician. Well, he says that's why I came down south, right? But Jon Snow, too, with his whole arc with the White Walkers, even though, do I like episode three now? <laughs> because it feels like his whole thing was the Great War, the Long Night, defeating the White Walkers. That came and went. As much as I liked the episode from a technical aspect, and Arya killing the Night King still was very surprising, now even that feels underwhelming. Well, even here where I see that last... Because we're making the point, oh, it doesn't matter about the supernatural threat. It matters about the politics. But then the biggest political revelation is him being Aegon Targaryen. And you're saying right now, what what does that even matter? Watching Jon go beyond the wall with Tormund and the Wildlings, I'm like, that's kind of... Po- it's where he belongs. It's poetic. It makes sense. And I kind of... I like it from that standpoint. But the way it got... It just felt very... It just happened. Oh, John, you have to go back to the Night's Watch. He just killed Daenerys. Isn't he the rightful king? Like, just because Grey Worm? Yeah, because the Unsullied, who yeah. all just left? <laughs> yeah, don't like it. Like, they still have to, like, Bran has to compromise with them. to make peace with the Unsullied. That's that's where it all fell flat for me. That last scene, too, I still had so much emotion during that last scene. Seeing all the Starks take their place and going where they, I guess, always were destined to be. But the bridge there was very underwhelming and that scene with him and Tyrion it, it was it was a good scene I guess like him trying to contemplate like what like what he did was it right or not Tyrion comforts him in the way of saying it was our decision too yes we both had to make this choice also going back to when Tyrion admitted to being in love with Daenerys he says I loved her not as successfully as you did mm-hmm. how can you not fall in love with that individual when you no seriously I'm saying when she's the way that he viewed her basically is his entire time knowing her. She's yeah. just, she's powerful, she's beautiful, she wants to make the world a better place. Well, Jorah fell. Right, everybody, it, it's impossible not to fall for her. But yeah, I, I wonder if this leaves it open for them revisiting the series in some way. And I had said this on the preview video, that the, the ending wasn't going to be definitive. It's, the world continues. I would like to see them revisit the show in some in some aspect. His farewell to all the Starks, it's their destiny. Arya becomes Henry Hudson. She's going to go explore west of Westeros. That's been talked about a lot on Reddit forums and blog posts. What makes up the rest of the, the world map of, of this fictional universe? Bran being king, obviously. And Sansa, queen in the north, was awesome. That crown, too. And the throne, or the chair she's sitting in. So fresh with and the And Sophie Turner. Yes. She's looking clean. Was Lord Glover the one that proclaimed their it queen? It sounded like Lord Glover. The queen in the north. I hope he's fucking dead. Um, but yeah, I mean, those po- like those points I love. And John seeing ghosts, missing an ear, I guess. Oh, poor boy. Still but he fluffed know, him. Still don't know why Ghost was leading the, the charge of the Dothraki. How did he survive? Who knows? Um, but that moment, too, like him back north with ghosts, with Tormund, that's been most of his arc. And most of his arc, too, is not wanting to rule. So if you would have told John a few weeks ago that he would live out the rest of his days in the wilderness with him and his wolf, his best friend, doing northern things, he would have been like, yeah, I'm okay with that. Yeah. How do we get there? How do yes. we make that happen? I feel like that's what John would want. He didn't crack a smile at the end, but I thought he might have. And seeing that Game of Thrones theme, the, the wall shutting, the gates closing, him looking back, you see all the children, the wildlings. I like it. Don't like how it got there. 
What about Brienne? Somebody wrote that Brienne was changing Jamie's Wikipedia page. <laughs> That's the hardest I've cried. Really? In, in all of like Game in of all of the show? Really? The, before that, it was ju- it was uh, King of the North. Uh, Promise me Ned, baby to John. I don't know why, but her writing in Jamie's in Jamie's book was it hit me hard. Yeah. Jamie's one of my favorite characters. She loved him so much that she could forgive him for what he did at the very end. Exactly, and she's just making his like putting his legacy, everything his character, everything his character strived to be. She put it in ink, and that was like the final, it's the final page, the final page of the Jamie Lannister book, right there. And he deserved that. She deserved to have that closure. It's funny because when I thought about his end in the previous episode, the first thing that came to mind was the Book of Brothers, and how it's essentially still empty that nobody is going to remember his deeds. So having Brienne do that, it would have been unfortunate if the last scene we saw with Brienne was her outside begging Jamie not to leave. For her to do that for him, something that he'll never know happened, but it's something that he deserved. We always say he was a very complex character, but the world deserved to know the good deeds that he did commit and that he finally will be remembered as a man of honor. That's the only thing that he ever fought for. And the final line of he died protecting his queen. Even that, that got me too, man. Yeah, that, that was that was bad. And the, Not the, bad in the sense of her running, but bad for my emotional state at that point. The small council scene with Tyrion, I like this scene too. I thought this was a great end for Tyrion Lannister, where they're they're deliberating again, and Bronn is Lord of Highgarden <laughs> and Master of Coin. Yes, uh, Davos is the Master of Ships. Brienne is, I guess, Lord of the Lord, Lord Commander, Lord Commander of, the of the Kingsguard, who does sit on the small council. And Sam, Samuel Tarley as the Archmaester. I don't know if he graduated. He got a, Sam got an honorary doctorate. He got an, <laughs> I guess you deserve that. Yeah. You go through all of that. And he gives Tyrion, he presents Tyrion the book, Archmaester Ebros' Song of Ice and Fire. He came up with the title. And that's another callback to season two, episode 10, where Varys tells Tyrion that they'll, nobody's going to remember what you did, but we won't forget. Yes. Tyrion's frustrated again. He's, oh, you know, was he critical of me? No, not necessarily. Oh, wow, that's oh, I'm not in it. I don't think it was everyone's like prediction, but that was always the thing saying like, but that was always the thing people talked about is it would end with Sam writing the I- World of Ice and Fire or the Song of Ice and Fire, and the book would be closing kind of like a Bilbo Baggins type thing. Right. But it didn't end like that. But that's kind of how it happened. Yeah, and them going back and forth talking about how they're going to rebuild the city that the Lord of Highgarden needs to offer <laughs> some resources for food, feed the citizens and some financial support for rebuilding the ships. And this was funny too, it was a callback to Littlefinger when Braun makes a point that they should be rebuilding the brothels instead cuz you know, whores don't sink, ships do. <laughs> so Braun taking some advice from the previous master of coin. Did Littlefinger have to die? <laughs> I'd like to see what he would have done. <laughs> right, yeah. Oh, he would have convinced the Night King to, like... <laughs> do something. Do something <laughs> yeah. to benefit him. He would have gotten his ear somehow. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like this scene, too, but it was just... I was still trying to recover from, like, what happened before that, and it just felt rushed, uh, sloppy, jumbled, if you want to say. Uh, I like all the big moments. Like I said, even the John thing at the end, it was very You know in the end of on that. Snakes of a Plane where Samuel Jackson goes surfing? Yeah. <laughs> I always found that it was a weird ending because it was all these snakes just murdered everybody on this plane and then he's just surfing at the very end. So I got a good ending. That's how this felt. They were all just having a good time. I once brought a honeycomb and a jackass in a brothel. Yeah, you know but like genocide just happened. It's like them having that moment, John being who like he always wanted to be, Sansa being always who she wanted to be, Arya being who always she wanted to be. The bridge there was like... Bad? <laughs> not good. Not great. Not great, but it's still bittersweet, man. He he told us, and that's what we got. And Pod on the Kingsguard. So, sadly, his talents will be wasted. What a Mary Sue. <laughs> Just doesn't die. Now he's a Kingsguard. I bet, I bet he managed them to change the rules. Yeah. Well, so the knights are allowed to get married. That wouldn't be fair if they didn't. <laughs> that is true. The whores would go screaming from Dawn to Castle Rock. Yes. Another emotional point was when John said bye to everybody. Sansa, Arya, Arya was a big one too, and Bran. Bran is kind of like he bent the knee and is like, "Peace." <laughs> I know you don't really care, so I'm just gonna leave. <laughs> yeah, but with the one with the Sansa and Bran, uh, Arya was, and that's when she says that she's going east. Right. Yeah, that she's going to explore. She's going west, actually. Yeah, in this moment too, John kind of hints that Sansa is going to be the one to lead 
the North. We called that. Yeah. Go watch our uh, <laughs> the deconstruction of a fantasy, Sons of Stark. <laughs> Yay. Just don't watch What Do the White Walkers Want anymore. Just don't watch it. Just or don't. Who Will Kill Cersei Lannister. Yeah, Who Will Kill Cersei Lannister. Just don't watch that one. Or is Jon Snow is Zora High. Just skip that one, too. Our Westworld content. We were confused during Westworld Season 2 as well. I couldn't tell you what happened last I'll season. tell you what. Hollow- our Halloween review. <laughs> that's that's one of our best videos. <laughs> Very underrated. But, yeah, it's it's over, man. It is over, yeah. Game of Thrones, Season 8, Episode 6, Series Finale, The End. To what I think we can still say is one of the best and most influential television series of all time. You're never going to find... We keep hearing about what's going to be the next Game of Thrones. You're never going to find it because it was a deconstruction, literally, of the fantasy genre. You took all of these tropes. But the strength of this show has always been the characters and the personalities that created that he created, that you were able to latch on to these characters, that you rooted for them, you loved them, you hated them. That was the genius of this show. And the world building. The fantasy world of Game of Thrones, I said it's the pinnacle of fantasy writing because this world is so rich and there's so much depth to it. There's so much to explore. Where you look at the ending of this show, it leaves the door open to all these different sequels. Arya being Christopher Columbus, Jon going back north, Sansa ruling as Queen in the North, Bran being the king of the Six Kingdoms. And then you have other continents where there's stuff happening there too. It's everything that this show has done with the way they've handled magic, the way that they've handled prophecy, It's been brilliant, and you can have your mixed feelings on this final season, but it's still a show that I will always love, I will always revisit, and it's just, it's been a big part of my life, and I'm thankful to have experienced this world. Thank you to D&D, don't don't kill me, and thank you to George R. R. Martin for creating this world. It's such a big part of our lives, and for us to just say we didn't like the ending or we were disappointed by certain aspects, and for that to be our view of the whole show would be irresponsible, and I think foolish, so... Even if you didn't love how it ended, I think viewing it as a whole, it just the cultural impact it had, the way it changed our lives is there will be nothing like this ever again, or not for the foreseeable future. The way it incorporated every genre into a kind of fantasy setting, and like you said, the characters with a strong suit where everyone was able to relate to any character. That's why it was so split. You had Daenerys fans, you had Jon fans, you had Rob fans, Sansa fans, Arya fans, Cersei fans, Jaime fans. You don't have that in anything else. You're You're just a fan of who they want you to root for. But here there was such an array of choices and for people for you to latch onto and the character development and the character arcs that these people went through was something unprecedented on TV where you never really knew what was going to happen to the characters you've grown to love and you never knew what changes they would take. Jamie, bad guy to good. Daenerys, good to bad. Cersei, bad to... Still (laughs) still bad, but you kind of got a different perspective on her and you've learned to root for her in certain aspects. And they played with your emotions and tugged on all your heartstrings. And it's something that was truly unique and just took the world by storm. And I'll be forever grateful for the work D&D did for getting me to buy into the show and eventually read the books and learn the world that George built. Because without them, and I think for a lot of fans, I would have never read the books or knew who George R. R. Martin was. Yeah, it was popular before the show, but that's the thing. These gems are hiding out there, and it took D&D to took HBO to have faith in this project. It's so funny when you watch these actors' interviews and they talk about when they first got the role and they would tell people close to them, oh, I'm going to be in a fantasy series. They go, oh, fantasy? Mm -hmm. And I think people had a lot of, there's a lot of stigma around that. There's still people that I know that won't watch it just because I don't like dragons. Mm -hmm. But it's so much more than that. It's, like you said, the incorporation of all the genres, the real-world history. It's truly a, a magnum opus in the making for the books. And the show itself, is still such a great fantasy epic, and it gave us this platform here on NerdSoup. That's why we have to be eternally grateful that we're allowed to now talk about other things that we enjoy. Never seen anything like it in pop culture, the way that it's just dominated everything this year. And people are going to be screaming and yelling and complaining, and that's unfortunate, but that's just the name of the game. No, it's fine for people to have their complaints, and... I respect them, and I kind of see where they're coming from, but but it's, I think it's just overall like kind of unfortunate that this is the ending for it. Not in, and not in the fact that the way it ended, but just how everyone seemed to be divided, where in a perfect world, everyone should have been on board for this. And there's a number of reasons why that didn't happen, but I was still excited, and it was a big night for me, and still trying to... <laughs> Still trying to grasp that this is the last one, but it is. Yeah, and this is the last episode of Game of Thrones that we will review. It's a bittersweet ending for us, too. We'll obviously have some more 
Game of Thrones content in the future, probably do a season eight review, a couple of more podcasts, and we have the Long Night prequel coming up. There, uh, Game of Th- yeah, Game of Thrones isn't going anywhere, and neither are we. We hope that the new subscribers that we've gained during this season and the subscribers that we've gained over the past couple of years stick with us because we would like to explore new movies, new shows, things that we can review, things that we love to shine a light on them because it's just what we love to do. It's what we do in our free time when the mics are off. We're here, we're talking about movies, we're talking about shows, and we've got a schedule here of things that we want to review over the summer, things that some of our Patreon supporters have suggested, and thank you to all of them for supporting us. But Nerd Suit, we're, we're going to try and continue to grow. Yeah, and like you said, there's going to be a number of prequels that we can talk about, the books, and it's good to get into some other things. Like we said, Westworld, that's coming out season Not three. doing Westworld. Eh, we'll see what No, that. no. <laughs> You're too confused? It's too confusing. So basically what we're trying to say is, please don't leave us. Don't, don't. We work so hard to get here. I know I say don't like, don't share, and unsubscribe at the end of the page, but don't do that. Just just stay. I'm, we're begging you. The HBO money's run out. <laughs> Teddy spent it all on McDonald's. Hey guys, thank you for watching this video, and before we go, I want to quickly thank our Patreon supporters. Without your support, we wouldn't be able to grow and evolve as a channel, so thank you for your generous pledges. If you are interested in supporting our channel through Patreon, visit www.patreon.com nerdsoup, and you can see the different rewards we offer to our Patreon supporters. T-shirts, mugs, stickers, access to our behind-the-scenes video, and more. Thanks again for watching this video, and make sure you like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Or dislike, don't share, and unsubscribe. It's a binary world, folks.